uh, a big welcome to Mr. Hans Lindberg. So, Thank you so much, Henry, for the opportunity to speak at your conference. Um, um, I will try briefly to present and discuss the current situation for the Swedish banks and then outline two important challenges we have uh, ahead uh, the coming years. How do you Oh, fantastic. Very well. Uh, let me start by stating that uh, Swedish banks stand firm, really. Compared with the rest of Europe, they are extremely healthy. If you look at the stress test that was published last summer, uh, you see that the Swedish banks it's not working. I see one picture there and another there. <laughs> well, it will be a quite boring presentation. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyhow, uh, the Swedish banks stand firm. In the stress test made by EBA last summer, uh, the Swedish bank came up on top, really. Uh, the Swedish FSA actually used much worse figures than they used uh, in the rest of the uh, European Union. They uh, had a drop in housing prices with 40% and a drop in GDP with 12%. But nothing really happened with the Swedish banks. They were still in top. Next, please. And I believe that the strength uh, lies in the co combination of very high capitalization and low credit risks and losses. If you see this diagram to the right, you can see Italy, bad loans, uh, non-performing loans around 18%. And uh, usually in Sweden, uh, since the beginning of the 90s, we have had around 1-2% non-performing loans. And also, if we look at uh, the credit ratings, we see that... Uh, next picture, please. <coughs> Uh, we see that uh, also here the Swedish banks uh, come out on top really with uh, very high credit ratings. And next please. And when we compare the business models uh, of different countries, it's clear that Swedish banks are very cost efficient. Uh, you see, here you have Swedish banks and the rest of it. Compare the cost to assets and cost to income. So, the Swedish banks have a very strong position. They are well capitalized and also cost efficient and have low credit risks. But if we look ahead now, we have some clouds on this sunny, clear sky. And I think it's uh, two issues that are particularly important. First, uh, we have raised taxes and fees. And now we have a clear tendency of over-regulation. So at the end of this presentation, I will talk a little about, about uh, what we call the Basel IV regulation that will probably come ahead. Next, please. 
And most of these proposals about taxes uh, take uh, the position that the Swedish banks have excessive profits. And I would say that that's not the case, definitely not the case. In this diagram, you can see that the 40 largest companies on the Swedish stock exchange and the bank with the highest return on equity is on place 20. And the average for the banks is below the average, of course, of the rest of the companies. So there are no excessive profits within the Swedish banking sector. But of, of course it's correct that the Swedish banks have a much higher profitability than the rest of the European banks, but not compared with other companies in Sweden. Next please. In spite of this, the government had a proposal last autumn of a new financial tax on wages within the financial sector, an extra tax of 15%. In the end, this proposal was withdrawn because then 60,000 jobs would have been lost in the Swedish economy, the Swedish financial sector. But at the very same uh, press conference, Magdalena Andersson, the Swedish finance minister, presented a new proposal, a much higher resolution fee than before, and most importantly, that the resolution fee would be permanent. And in addition, she said, because of these excessive profits within the banking sector, they would come back before the next election, 2018, with a proposal of a new banking tax. So, uh, let us take a look at this new proposal then, and the consequences. And next please. The Swedish resolution fee in the current system is quite ambitious. We have a target level of 3%, and the target level within the EU is only 1%. And we have also the ambition to reach the target of 3% quite fast, within half of the time than they reach the target within the rest of the European Union, the banking union. So, there is no reason whatsoever really in this situation to increase the resolution fee and no arguments were raised at the press conference for increasing the fee. Not really. They talked a lot about the problems with Italian banks and other banks in the Mediterranean region, but not really said anything uh, about Swedish conditions. Next, please. But anyhow, given, despite that we already has this ambitious system, uh, which uh, actually is three times higher in concerning the end result compared with the banking union and Denmark, they, next please, they uh, came up with this proposal. And the proposal is basically that the banks together will pay 13 billion kroner each year in resolution fee from now and forever. And this of course will mean that we will get an infinitely high resolution reserve. And then you can ask yourself, why would a finance minister would like to have a 
such a high reserve? Well, the reason for that is that you don't place this money in a special fund as they do in the banking union. Uh, you place them into an account at the, the Swedish National Debt Office. And when you do that, you can use the money to finance expenses in the budget. So it's a money machine, simply. Next, please. And here you can see uh, that the resol resolution reserve isn't the first line of defense, it's the third line of defense. The first one is, of course, the capital requirements, and we have very high capital requirements. We have uh, a very ambitious proposal about emerald, <coughs> and then Apart from having 500 billion there, 500 billion there, we will have 200 billion there. But these 200 billion will not be there. They will be used to finance expenses for the government. Next, please. So how would I prefer that you would construct this system? Well. We would like to have a special fund for the reserve, so the politicians don't get tempted again to raise the fee. It would have been good to, to keep the money at the National Debt Office, but apparently the temp temptation is too high, so it's better to place than the money in a special fund. And we don't see any reason to increase this target level of 3% whatsoever. I would say that you could find argument instead of lowering the level, given the new information that arised the last two years or so. But, um, and then of course, when you reach uh, the target level, it's not rational to, to pay more money. It's not good for competition between Swedish and uh, uh, foreign banks. And you Swedes have probably read in the newspapers that there is a risk that Nordea will move their head office from Sweden and then Nordea will be a foreign bank. Uh, and then have lower capital requirements than the other three Swedish banks and they will not pay this resolution fee and they will compete with the other three Swedish banks with clear advantages. And moreover, uh, Swedish authorities will lose control of financial stability here in Sweden, really because today they have control. But I would say that this step, this suggestion, this proposal from the government uh, is out of bound really what you can do if you are a, a small economy within the European Union. And they didn't think that thought really. <coughs> but they have time and should do it now instead, and withdraw the proposal. So, to conclude, as uh, uh, I, I've already said uh, most of this, but uh, um, if the government don't withdraw this uh, proposal, uh, our judgment is that the proposal against the, is against the EU law. So then we will talk with the EU Commission and in the end then the government must need to have the, the approval from the EU Commission to go ahead with the proposal. Yes, please. Another issue is tendency to over-regulation. 
In a way, it's quite impressive how the regulation machine uh, has succeeded in 10 years to come up with so many regulations. And many of them, uh, I think, is, is good and uh, improves financial stability here in Sweden and in Europe as a whole. But uh, now we are on the edge to, to being overregulated, actually. And I think these negotiations about the Basel IV regulation for capital requirements is a good example. <laughs> Basically, to simplify, these nego negotiations concern first uh, a new standardized model for, for banks, and then how these internal models for credit risks uh, could be constructed in the future. And the most important thing in the negotiations from a Swedish perspective is the so-called capital floors in the internal models. The capital floors is that you put the floor when you rate your risks in the portfolio, you say that uh, the risk can't be lower than 60, 70 or 80 percent of the risk in the standard model. The case for the Swedish economy and the Swedish banks is that we are a low-risk economy with low-risk banks. So if you put a high capital floors in the internal model, you raise capital requirements extremely much for Swedish banks. And as I said, Swedish banks are well capitalized uh, already. Next, please. Uh, this diagram shows the Basel minimum requirements. And here you can see the EU average. And here you can see the Swedish implement implementation. Basically, uh, that was a decision that the former government took back in 2010, that we should uh, capitalize the Swedish banks much and fast. And I think that was a good decision, because I worked for the former government. So <laughs> it was a good decision. But now, next please, we have the situation that if these capital floors are imposed. Here we are today, and for instance, if we have capital floors at 75%, the capital requirements all of a sudden would be on this level. And the latest information I got uh, before Trump entered the stage was that they were talking about capital floors around 70, 80 percent. And if we would put the capital floors on 75 percent, then the Swedish banks would need a lot more capital. Today they have around 540 billion CEC uh, at CET1 capital, and then they would need around 240 extra billion to reach the 75% level. So it would be an increase in capital with more than 50%. Of course, you can balance this to some extent by decrease, uh, decrease, decreasing the, the Swedish uh, buffer that we have today, but you can balance it all, so to say. But next, please. And this will, of course, not only influence the banks, it will influence the whole economy. It will, a lot of more capital will be needed, and with these higher capital requirements, the banks cannot lend as much money as before. And it will put an upward pressure on interest rates. And in the end, this will lower Swedish GDP permanently and productivity and also average 
earnings, wages in the economy, and the effects will be quite big, really. And if you listen to the central bank, Stefan Ingves, he, he doesn't talk about this at all. More is always good in his world. Next, please. We had uh, Oliver Wyman calculating the effects on lending rates to different categories of customers. And if you look here at the triple B, for instance, with uh, a capital floor at 75%, the lending rate would increase by 90 basis points. And the effects for SME uh, would be 70 basis, basis points. So the, the effects are quite <coughs> big overall. Uh, the effects on residential real estate isn't that high because we already have a capital floor for, for that kind of lending. Excuse me. And we asked another firm, uh, Copenhagen Economics, to calculate the effects on Swedish GDP. And uh, here to the right you can see uh, the uh, total effect from all regulations uh, that has been conducted since the, financial, the beginning of the financial crisis and somewhere in the range of 2.6 to 3.9% on GDP level. So each year the GDP level be 3.5% lower than otherwise. So financial regulations are not free. It, they come with a cost. So let's take a look at the costs. Uh, Copenhagen Economics uh, calculated the, the benefits and the costs of these capital uh, floors on our behalf. And uh, here you see the tiny benefits. And that, that isn't strange because uh, the Swedish banks are already high, uh, well capitalized. So you don't gain much more instability by increasing the capital further, but the costs are quite big. And let me mention Stefan Ingves again, because when he talks about this, he always said that it's always worth to capitalize the banks even further. But the strange thing with Basel IV is that the banks that will need most capital from, from this uh, uh, reform is the banks that are already well capitalized. Banks in Sweden, the Nordic countries, Netherlands and Germany. But the countries in the southern part of Europe is not really, yeah, you know. So the target picture of this is quite strange. And um, this diagram uh, really shows the, it's a kind of, it shows when you have very little capital, you gain a lot in stability, the economy gain by capitalizing the bank. But at some point, uh, the costs are bigger uh, than the gains. And I would say that uh, the Swedish banks are somewhere here, so we don't gain more by capitalizing the banks even further. So it's top priority from our side to stop uh, this uh, thoughts about capital floors. But unfortunately, um, uh, we have tried our very best, but now uh, President Trump uh, sits uh, on the decision, so to say. Next, please. Um, what's happened really this winter was that they were about to make an agreement in the Basel Committee. But then uh, President Trump entered the stage and he wrote 
uh, one of his uh, pals, so to say, wrote this letter to uh, Janet Yellen at Fed and that basically said, don't ne negotiate anything at all and you should think about how to uh, uh, break previous uh, uh, agreements, really. So now these, ne these negotiations are more or less frozen, but I would say that there is a clear risk that there will be an agreement <coughs> in the end, because for the American banks, this agreement will be an advantage. They will have clear competitive advantages vis-a-vis -vis European banks. So when some one of uh, Mr. Trump's advisors says to him, I think we should sign this, it's good for America. And Mr. Trump says that, good for America, good, we sign. Then we will have this capital floor, and then it's only a matter of what level we will find this floor. 60%, uh, 70%, or 80%, I would say. Next, please. When it talks about regulation, I think it's a clear problem here in Sweden that no one's really taken responsibility for the overall picture. Uh, the National Debt Office puts proposals about EMRO. You have uh, the Swedish FSA coming up with new proposals about capital requirements. And then you have a government that is very eager to put new taxes or fee, raise fees and so on. So no one really takes responsibility for the overall picture. And um, in the end, someone has to do that because otherwise we will not have a, a well-functioning credit system really. And uh, there are other proposals that I won't mention here today. Uh, we have a proposal about macroprudential policy. Uh, and in the end, I think uh, that proposal risks getting the Swedish household credit market more regulated than it was in the beginning of the 1980s without a real discuss, dis, dis, discussion about it. But that is, was, is what is about to happen, really. Next, please. So, to conclude, the sun is shining over Swedish banks, but there are some clouds. Hopefully, uh, the government will uh, back on the proposal uh, about the resolution fee. But uh, there is a risk that we will have a Basel IV agreement with capital floors, and then we uh, have to make some changes here in Sweden about the internal Swedish capital buffers that we have today, otherwise we don't will have a well-functioning system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hans. An excellent presentation. Um, questions for Hans? Corinne? Ready, Mike? Of course. Thank you, Corinne Tronsi, Kofas. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for sharing this with, you, with us, particularly the challenges ahead where obviously the profitability of the solution might be eroded at one point. I want to ask a very quick question because somebody earlier told me French people speak too much. So I'm going to ask a quick question. Going back to one of your first slides, today you're showing that the Swedish banks are amongst the most profitable banks in Europe, let's put it this way. When I look at your listing, um, most, if not all, of the banks that are listing down after you in that ranking are, have been, and will continue to be using credit insurance as partners, even though they are in practice less profitable than you are. So my question to you will be the following. Why would that be? Why was that? And has there been any realistic, concrete discussion within the association to how to partner up with 
credit insurance to help financing exporters. I'm saying that because now that I listen to you, I see the world being a little bit gloomer, gloomier as we go ahead. So if we don't do it now, it might become more and more difficult for you. It's really a question for, for my member banks, but uh, before this presentation I took a look at the uh, EU re regulation uh, and uh, how the, it, it, you deal with it for uh, capital requirements and so on. And from what I understand, uh, uh, it is taken care of within the internal models. So a bank that starts using credit insurance come up with a proposal to the Swedish FSA how it, they should uh, uh, view uh, this insurance. So um, uh, I think you should try to, to sell these insurance and then uh, the bank should try to implement it together with the Swedish FSA in a reasonable way. That's a great advice, Hans. We will uh, take your word for that. Uh, another question. You mentioned um, we talked about uh, Nordea and, and the resolution fund and the threat of leaving. I mean, to be given your explanation, it's quite clear that we're looking at a tax, not a fee. Mm -hmm. um, and in the insurance sector, we like to express things in terms of probabilities. So, can I ask you how probable do you think it is that Nordea would actually move their head office, provided the uh, uh, this new resolution fee would would come into uh, come into force. Uh, I don't want to make a guess concerning the deer, but I can make a guess concerning what Magdalena Andersson uh, will do about this uh, resolution fee proposal. Uh, it must be evident for her now that this proposal uh, isn't good in uh, any aspect really. And uh, she realized that in the end it will destroy her control of financial stability and in the end she will get uh, a smaller fee than uh, before the raise of the fee actually because if Nordea leaves then fifth, five six billion in, in, in fee uh, uh, moves away from, from Sweden so it, it, in the end she will get less money not more then it's only a question uh, how um, to, uh, to, uh, to um, uh, withdraw this proposal in a decent way, really. And I really hope she, she do that, because it, it isn't good for Sweden, really. It's not, not a question about Nordea, it's a question about financial stability and so on. Thank you. Any other questions? I think the rest will uh, follow in that case. <laughs> I don't guess about Nordea, I don't <laughs> guess about the rest either. Uh, but I can assure you that uh, Svenska Bank Föreningen will still have his head <laughs> office and so on. That's very reassuring, Hans. Thank you for that. We should try to quantify the economic effects of that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, coming back on high capitalization, so obviously Swedish banks are, are well capitalized. Um, opponents to that would argue that the reason is that, that the banks represent such a large proportion of, of the entire economy. I think the last number I saw was 400% of GDP. Well, what's your take on that? Well, it, uh, uh, the 400% is an um, effect of Nordea, that they have uh, a lot of their uh, banking abroad, really. So. Uh, but of course, we have a, a big uh, <coughs> banking industry in Sweden, and we should be happy with that. And we have dealt with it in a good way. We have high capital requirements and so on, and uh, we have been very ambitious in this field. Um, so I, I rather have a banking sector of 400% than 40%. Any further, Rick? Um, thinking about these capital requirements, I mean, the, I guess it goes back to 2008 and, and what happened then. So, did we have too low capital requirements at that time? Uh, 
the capital requirements was uh, then around the EU average that was a bit uh, lower than today. So I think uh, the step taken since uh, the financial crisis uh, is very good, uh, all in all. And as I showed on the picture there, I think we are in a kind of optimum, really. And uh, we shouldn't uh, increase the requirements further, really. Uh, the banks in Sweden are strong, and they, if you can handle uh, a decline in GDP with 12% and a decline in housing prices with 40%, that's a, that's a harder stress test than uh, the financial crisis in the, in the beginning of the 90s, really. Any further questions? Thank you. Um, you gave a, a very interesting statistic, if I may say so, in a, an extremely interesting and challenging presentation. You mentioned that um, Swedish banks generally had 1-2% in non-performing loans. Mm. Um, it was mentioned earlier that the sun was shining. Um, with only 1-2% to of non-performing loans and with the remarkable levels of capitalization, um, why on earth do Swedish banks want to be involved with trade credit insurance uh, for domestic risks? Uh, well, uh, you have to explain that. <laughs> it's not... <laughs> I don't know why you asked that question. But, uh, <laughs> okay, let's. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, well, I, I would consider all risks to be credit insurable, but but uh, but yeah, I take your point. Okay. Any further questions? So thank you very much, Hans. It was a pleasure to have you here, and. Um, on behalf of the Credit Insurance Association, oh. some flowers. Thank you so much. Okay, very interesting presentation. Uh, so, it's now five to four, so uh, we'll do a break until quarter past four when we continue and uh, uh, get the next interesting presentation from Mike. Thank you very much. Thank you.